Hello, I'm Maria Soreo. The Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce held their first annual breakfast at the Terranea Resort to discuss ways to improve the economy. The local business community was in attendance as well as a USC professor who gave business leaders an economics lesson. Liz Brown Swanson has all the details and joins us from Terranea. Liz. Hi, Marie. I'm here at Taran Air. I'm outside the Catalina Room where the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce is holding their first annual breakfast mixer. There was a great turnout and a keynote speech delivered by a USC business professor who's talking about how to turn around the economy. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about how we got into the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 and why the economy has not recovered very well. And the most important thing is that there's not been a recovery in private sector investment. And that's tied into employment, it's tied into sluggish wage growth, and the, mo the main thing why that's happening is, I think, because of what's been happening with the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. So I'm going to be talking about that uh, for most of the talk. I just spoke with Dr. Cunningham. He gave me a little sneak preview of the presentation today. He's going to talk about the so-called fiscal cliff, things that are happening and things that he thinks would happen, ha help the economy. We are seeing definitely um, some new businesses coming in. Uh, we have new dance studios, new retail, some new restaurants. Um, but, you know, it's tough. And I think uh, as a whole, California as a state needs to really work on more business-friendly legislation. Here at the Chamber, we uh, devote a great deal of effort to advocating with our legislators for less permits and streamlining you know the ability for businesses to open and also helping new businesses get greater access to capital because when you talk to new business owners those are the key things the regulations and the access to capital look at what's happened with Terranea since you opened the doors obviously there were some a lot of financial concerns and worries you've turned it around and certainly to be in, here at this resort is as successful as it's been what has what was able to really get your resort to where it is and to be so successful I think two things. One, the community involvement in what we're doing. Everyone embraced us and has um, really used us in any way for social functions and overnights. And then our group business is so strong, it's really national. We feel proud because we have now blossomed to 1,200 associates, um, so 1,200 employees. So we feel really great about that. And many of our employees, particularly during the summer, come from right here on the peninsula. So we're very proud of that. When you talk to the local businesses here, what do they tell you? What are they saying? They are saying that over about the last 12 months, things are improving, albeit slowly. Um, we are definitely seeing an uptick in the residential housing market and also in the commercial side of real estate. And that's important. Those are both key drivers of our local economy. Um, but people are still on the consumer side are a little tentative and a little bit holding on to their money. But um, you know, today's paper, the headline was median home price sales are up 20% in the last month. So that's good news for all of us. What I would do is I would return the Fed to a monetary rule. It worked very well in the 1980s and 1990s under Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it led to a big burst of investment, which led to very high job growth, low unemployment, high GDP growth. And it worked not just in the United States, but in other countries as well. The problem was when we departed from it around 2002 and never really got back to it. We had a monetary policy that was erratic, that had a lot more uncertainty, and that dissuaded people from investing. Now, the USC professor kept reminding the audience that it's still difficult to be upbeat about the economy, but he does see signs of a recovery and that things will turn around. Back to you, Maria. Thanks, Liz. Now, during the Peninsula Chamber's breakfast mixer, there was a changing of the guard. RPV Mayor Susan Brooks swore in the Chamber's new board of directors for 2013. The new board chairman is RPV resident George Walker. Well, I'm enjoying my time on the board of the, of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, and I'm looking forward to a wonderful year as, a, as the chairman of that board. Uh, you know, the Chamber has 
uh, lots of different roles here. Our signature event is the street fair. We're looking forward to a great street fair this year. And we worked very hard to promote a positive business climate and to bring education and opportunities to the businesses here on the peninsula. I, I worked for Unical for 36 years and retired as the vice president, and I'm, I'm proud of that. And now I've moved on into working with small business owners, actually coaching them. You know, because coaches have questions, consultants have to have answers. So I, what I do is I, I work with small business people to help them take their businesses to the next level. Yes, well I think Terranea is a good example of the vibrant, healthy business community we have here on the peninsula. We have, we're blessed with a wonderful climate, with, with smart, well-educated uh, people who are very ambitious and start their own businesses. So it, it's, it's a wonderful place to work and a wonderful place to live. Right now we just finished listening to the USC uh, economic professor and he talked about trying to be upbeat but saying yet it's still quite difficult to do that and um, looking for signs of a turnaround in the economy. What were your takeaways from what he had to say? There are lots of challenges. I think we all heard that. There are lots of challenges in moving our economy forward. He, he did talk about seeing some opportunities and I guess the best thing he said was that economists aren't very good at predicting what's going to happen. They were, they're much better at showing what has happened and he did a great job of showing that, showing what the challenges are and, and I saw some optimism there. Congratulations to George Walker and his new team at the Chamber. Well, you could say business is booming at RPV's new temporary dog park. Since Rancho Caninos Park opened its doors, more and more dogs and their owners are visiting the park, which is located right behind the RPV City Hall. Liz Brown Swanson joins us with the latest. Hi, Marie. I'm here at Rancho Caninos Park, where everyone is having a great time, the dogs and their owners. That's awesome. Um, I was just saying earlier, this is Rudy and we've got Buddy over here. Rudy, it's great because he's used to being a free runner back in Connecticut and when I moved back home to Palos Verdes where I grew up, um, he didn't have a place to do that. This is just fantastic. We can see the ocean, have our coffee, the dogs get good exercise and yeah, he's 12 years old and he acts like he's two here. It's perfect. Uh, the got the bags, got water, and it's fenced in, so it's a good deal, I think, for everybody. I've met some, uh, some friends of some friends, and uh, it's a good place for just the dogs to socialize, because maybe a lot of folks up here never made the drive to 190th or whatever, so this is a, this is a good place to come and hang out and let their dogs do their thing. Well, uh, we didn't want to call it something that would be confusing for the public. I thought that it needed its own distinct identity. I didn't want to call it Point Viceni Park, uh, Dog Park, because people might confuse that with the Interpretive Center calling it the Civic Center dog park seemed kind of boring so we wanted to come up with something sort of catchy and cute so the thought was that we try to go with something that uh, harkened back to the city's roots as a Spanish land grant and as a cattle ranch and playing off our own city name of Rancho Palos Verdes so um, we came up with um, Rancho Caninos I got some help from the folks in the Public Works Department two of our staff members Emilio Blanco and um, uh, Nadia Carrasco helped come up with a name make sure that it was correct uh, and it's just sort of a fun uh, little identifier and um, also to the logo uh, is the original cattle brand for the um, Rancho de los Palos Verdes cattle ranch that was here originally in the 1800s and we got permission to use that logo from the Ruth family who owns the copyright to it and we just sort of dressed it up with a little dog paw that you see on the logo just to make it kind of fun. We're getting a lot of use and also a lot of positive feedback um, the dog park is located here at Point Vicente Park where we've got City Hall and so staff is seeing a lot of good use. Use tends to pick up later in weekday afternoons and also on weekends and we're seeing maybe upwards of 10 dogs at any one time during heavy use. Um, so it's really going great. Good news to hear. Talk about the City Council, why the Council supported having a temporary dog, dog park in the city. Well, Council heard uh, from residents, Peninsula residents, that there is really a need and a desire for a local dog park on the peninsula. Uh, dog supporters have come to council meetings and they submitted a petition to the city requesting a local dog park and we all saw the response when council considered turning Rancho Palos Verdes Beach into a dog beach so there was clearly a demonstrated need and desire. Mm -hmm. There isn't a definite timeline as to when Rancho Caninos may close. The city council hasn't yet approved a master plan for Point Vicente Park where Rancho Caninos is located and so at this point future plans for the park and 
use just aren't known. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback and useful feedback. We've made uh, some changes already to the park based on feedback from um, visitors, so please keep it coming, and you can send it to the Recreation and Parks Department at parks at rpv.com or um, call us at 310-544-5260. And thanks, let us know what you think. Well, once we found the location, I think um, <clears throat> the layout came kind of together because it just kind of went with the contour of the of the location here and, and everything seemed to fit in really well. I think from the beginning when we started to put the dog park together with the gates, um, we were looking at different types of options that we had. We thought about maybe just an in and out gate on both sides and then we decided to put a dog run in. So we just added some second gates and an entrance and an exit on both sides of the dog park. We do maintenance on Monday, Wednesday and Friday and that they just come in and re replace the trash cans, remove the recyclables, uh, fill the dog stations and things like that. And then um, if we need to do um, uh, a little bit more maintenance where it's going to take some time, we have to close the park down and we post 48 hours in advance. And we also put it on the listserv. And that's for um, when we're going to close the park down for more than four hours or so. We do have parking available for them. We also have a handicap uh, parking availability. We have a, a porta potty with the uh, handicap accessibility and a water station and we also have dog uh, water bowls and doggy bags and trash containers and things like that for the public to use. Now if you want more information about the temporary dog park you can always go on the city's website at palaceverdes.com slash rpv. Back to you Maria. And in an effort to keep our communities safe, the Emergency Preparedness Committee is offering homeowners associations and other community groups a special informative presentation that could save lives. The committee is now accepting requests for the presentation called Beauty and the Beast. This program offers an interactive and practical approach designed to familiarize residents to prepare, respond, and recover from natural and human-made disasters. For more information on how you can host a presentation, please call RPV City staff at 310-544-5209 or you can email at tracyb at rpv.com. And when we come back, a local author gives us a lesson in history and if you ever wanted to see a whale, this might just be the time to catch a glimpse. We'll be right back. The Long Beach Opera invites you to the edge of madness with Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Fall of the House of Usher. The gothic horror story blurs the line between the real world and the supernatural. This will open Long Beach Opera's 2013 borderline season. Performances will be on January 27th, as well as February 2nd and 3rd at the Warner Grand Theatre in San Pedro. To purchase tickets, you can call the Long Beach Opera at 562-432-5934 or go to www.longbeachopera.org slash tickets. Caution! You have entered the Peninsula Extreme Fire Danger Zone. Prepare for an emergency before disaster strikes. Clear all brush and weeds 35 to 200 feet around your house. Make sure to have 10 feet of clearance around the chimney and do not store firewood or flammable materials next to your house. Remove all dead trees. Dry and dead trees will explode in a fire and send sparks quite a distance. Top and prune trees as a precaution, especially near utility lines. Do not plant trees on slopes. Instead, use ground cover or hillside to help hold the ground from eroding and keep fires from progressing. If trees are not topped and pruned, they become heavy during the rainy season and will pull down the tree and roots, causing mudslides. Trees not mended on a hillside in a fire with winds will feed the fire. Install sprinklers around your house. It's your home. Be safe and protect it. Keep debris such as pine needles and leaves cleaned off your roof and out of your gutters. Remember, the peninsula is an extreme fire danger zone. Use these tips and keep your family safe during the fire season. Visit our city website or come to the Emergency Preparedness Committee meetings and learn how you and your family can get prepared for an emergency.
Peninsula residents got a great history lesson from two local authors, Ginger Garnett Clark, author of Rancho Palos Verdes, and John Phillips, author of Palos Verdes Estates, shared their stories during a special event at the Book Frog in Rolling Hills Estates. My book is the only book on Rancho Palos Verdes. At least it was the, it was the only full history book. We've got some really cool other history books out now uh, from uh, Vanderlip area. But um, I wrote it because, actually I wrote it because I was asked to write it. Uh, I'm a docent at uh, the uh, Point Vicente Interpretive Center and Diana McIntyre, who uh, is the uh, curator there, I had done some writing for her and so when the uh, book acquisitions editor called her to find out if there was anybody, she sent him to me. And I said, sure, because I wanted an ISBN number, but I really knew nothing about the history of RPV. Um, but then I got to looking, and it's just, it's an incredible town. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have everything from the lighthouse to the ocean to the, to Green Hills, for Pete's sakes, when you're done, uh, to, uh, uh, well, you know, all the things that we have. We have history that is incredible people. Well, the book uh, deals with the early history of Palos Verdes Estates, specifically, and it does uh, go into some of the earlier history back uh, when the Vanderlip era, when he purchased the property, and, and even before that when it was uh, ranchos. But uh, my book pr predominantly deals with the uh, period of time when it was in development uh, to become quite a interesting community and it was one of the first planned communities which is pretty interesting and, and it was happening during the Roaring Twenties so it was uh, a time of great expectations and luxuries and uh, so it was really fascinating to learn about it. This community is huge with history. Um, there's a local history room in the Palos Verdes Peninsula Library and when people find out about it they say it's an incredible treasure and in fact the two authors here use that resource to write their books. So I think these books will be very well received by residents because they're just passionate about their own history. We have two great uh, local authors who, do, who wrote two great histories of the Peninsula area, uh, John Phillips and Ginger Clark and they're doing a signing. We love to support the local events in the store. We do book signings pretty much two or three times a month. We are very heavy as far as uh, we're having a mystery sale right now. We, uh, we try to have uh, events for everybody for all ages. When, when I read his book, I believe that I, my favorite part of it was when he talked about uh, Vanderlip and towards the beginning when they talked about the Phillips farm. Well, I came out to the book signing. I've lived you know, in, in Palos Verdes, the Palos Verdes area, on and off since I was born. Uh, my parents had their first house in what's now Rolling Hills Estates before it was Rolling Hills Estates. And I remember when that city was incorporated, when I read about the uh, book signing in the uh, breeze, I thought, you know, why not? I'll go, I'll go have a look. The book signing was to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Frank Vanderlip's purchase of Rancho de los Palos Verdes. And this year also marks the 40th anniversary of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. And throughout this year, RPV TV will feature stories about the city's founders and its history, so stay tuned. A National Highway Safety Administration report shows that in a collision, motorcyclists are 28 times more likely to die than occupants in other vehicles. When it comes to driving in a car or riding on a motorcycle, sharing the road safely can reduce the risk of injuries and death. Deputy Chris Cadman gives us more information on motorcycle safety. Uh, what kind of issues do you see when you're out on the road? Well, from an enforcement perspective, as well as being a rider, mm -hmm. um, I think people just, uh, the riders need to slow down and realize that we come up on drivers very quickly. Um, we have, there are a lot of blind spots in vehicles. Right. Uh, just always exercise good judgment and caution, slow down, um, make yourself uh, known through uh, uh, just being visible to come up before, but next to the driver's side. Okay. Um, don't speed as you're splitting lanes or doing uh, kind of uh, risky uh, maneuvering on the bike. Mm -hmm. um, for the drivers, just take an extra time to look through the mirrors, right. you know, uh, check, l turn your head when you're making turns and you're lane changing, and uh, 
it's it's dangerous for both the riders and the uh, people driving the car. So people just need to slow it down. Yeah, something we talk about too is the motorcyclists going between the cars on the freeway. That that is legal, right? It is. It is legal, and uh, it's one of those things where it's kind of hard to find fault, you know, one way because because the law permits it. Mm-hmm. So for the guys who are splitting lanes at fifty miles an hour and stop traffic, it's it's really not worth the risk. Slow it down. I think it should be harder to get a motorcycle license because it's inherently dangerous. And then uh, then you have the, the, the crowd that just doesn't take the time to um, really think about what they're doing. Because in a motorcycle, you have, to be, you have to be on your best game at every moment right. you know, for all sorts of circumstances. Debris, people cutting you off, um, inattentive drivers who are distracted with cell phones. And yeah, the same thing with the motorcycles. You have these guys... Uh, uh, driving like they think everybody sees them and, uh, you know, goofing off sometimes on phones, you know, all the above. It's a new year and many people are looking for a new car. Of course, they're always looking for ways to save on gas and many manufacturers have responded to the need. Mark J. Dotty shows us some of the newest cars who have gone a little greener. And in our travel beat, we join Jean Clayton, who takes us on a day trip to a historical church right here in Rancho Palos Verdes. Okay, you may say, what on earth is John Clayton doing in a cemetery? Well, we're here for a very special reason. We're going to see and talk about a church, a church in Green Hills Memorial Park. It's a new church. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is actually an old church that's been made new again. And to find out more about its fascinating history, we're going to talk to Ray Frew, the president of Green Hills Memorial Park. Well, it is a, a an old church in a new location. First church ever built in the city of San Pedro, 1883. 1883? 1883, and it has had uh, three homes in San Pedro, the most recent one being at a small cemetery in San Pedro where the city of Los Angeles took over the maintenance of the church, but uh, due to typical budgeting and it being long, uh, long forgotten, uh, it basically fell into disrepair, had been vandalized, was being used by vagrants, and things were stolen. And how did you hear about it? Yeah, very interesting. There was a uh, article actually in the local newspaper that the columnist had written about what a shame it was that this church was falling into such disrepair. And one of the comments said, why don't they move this to Green Hills Memorial Park? And I just like said to myself, why not? Wait a minute, moving a church is a lot different than getting in your car and my car. Yes. And moving, I mean, this is, wow, incredible. It, it, it certainly is. And of course, it was a total learning experience for everyone here. It seemed like an easy thing at the time. Uh, but then, of course, we have uh, bureaucracies involved in the city. We had the city of L.A. T- who had the church 
church, city of Rancho Palos Verdes, who had to give us a variance in our conditional use permit to bring it here. But then, uh, right from the beginning, we had to get an engineer, a structural engineer, to certify that it could be moved. Uh, in one of its earliest moves, uh, they moved it all in one piece on a flatbed truck, but then they lost the, the uh, bell tower. It oh. fell off, and <laughs> when, when we brought it here, we actually brought it in four pieces. Uh, quite an ordeal, took uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, we basically took off the bell tower, the belfry itself, uh, uh, took off the entire roof because we couldn't bring it up the streets with all the lights and uh, wires and everything else. Had the highway patrol, the sheriff's department, LAPD, fire, city officials, uh, department of building safety, everybody, our own crew doing the move. Um, and and uh, four pieces, uh, it took us, we started at just after midnight and we pulled in the front gates at Green Hills at about 2 a.m. to having made that four mile trip from his old home. For people who are watching, I'm sure you're saying, how can I get there? What do I need to know about it? Well, the answer is the website and the phone number, and they are? It's www.greenhillsmemorial, all one word, dot com. And the phone number is 310-831-0311. Again, this is an absolutely wonderful, memorable church. Uh, I personally love it, and as many of our viewers know, there are hundreds, uh, thousands of really wonderful churches in my country of birth, England. So I urge you to come out here and see this quiet, wonderful, wonderful place. And in our sports spotlight, I sat down with Peninsula High senior Matt McFarlane. Now, Matt's been playing basketball most of his life. He's received many awards, and now he talks candidly about playing his very last year of basketball as a Panther. Well, I started playing basketball in the fourth grade. Actually, I was a part of PBBA, which is like the local basketball league kind of like AYSO is for soccer. And I've played a variety of sports, but something about basketball just stood out to me. I think it's just everything basketball has to offer, like the, the strength that's involved, the jumping, the rebounding. And it's just such an, an exciting game to play. I think that's why I eventually chose basketball over other sports. Being a veteran, obviously, what kind of questions do new guys come in and ask you about? I think the biggest thing is just what it's like to play in front of the crowds. You know, there's when there's like, couple hundred people screaming in this gym it's just so overwhelming and for a lot of these young players it's it's really hard for them to you know deal with that and they just they're so curious to know what that's like and it's it's something you could only um, the only way you know what it's like is if you experience it for yourself so can you tell me about your coach and what you think that you've probably learned the most from him yeah, Coach Quick, um, he spotted me out as a little fresh. Actually, I wasn't a little fresh in. I was 6'1 then, but um, he spotted me from the beginning and, and really poured into me as a player. And um, he, I played JV my freshman year, and then he brought me up to the varsity sophomore year. I really didn't think I was going to play at all my sophomore year because we had such a good team, but I ended up you know, coming off the bench a little, getting some experience. And I think that experience... Um, has what is what give me the tools to you know be comfortable today you know playing in that setting and he's just such an inspiring coach um, every year he has this this talk he gives us like this year you, you only have 10 games left make them count and, he, and he's all about that just laying it all out on the court every night because I mean for me especially this is my last year I only have I'm only guaranteed eight more games and he just tells me every game, make this make this game count, because it's going to be gone soon. Is it strange to think back to all the games that you played, and now there's only a few left? Yeah, it's it's scary actually, because where does the time go? You know, I remember my first varsity game like it was yesterday. I was so nervous the whole day, and it's just like you blink and it's all gone. Yeah. And um, now I understand what he was saying when he was telling me my sophomore year, you have 80 something games left. Like that sounds like a lot, but when you think about it, it goes by so fast. So how old were you when you got your first basketball? I don't know. I've seen pictures of me in like the fifth grade with like this little basketball on my little YMCA shirt. Um, I don't know. It's uh, probably since birth, like probably like one or two. Thanks to Matt McFarland and best of luck in the future. 
And if you would like to nominate a local athlete we can feature right here on Peninsula Beat, you can email me at rpvtv at rpv.com. Now for all of our football fans out there, the Super Bowl is set, except this year it's actually called the Harbaugh Bowl. It'll be the first time in history that two brothers will coach against each other. Jim and John Harbaugh, who coach the 49ers and the Ravens, will face off on Sunday, February 3rd. Mark your calendars. And you can hear much more about this game on Playing the Field. So be sure to tune in every day at 9 a.m., 4 p.m., and 9 p.m. And finally, we end with a whale of a story. Right now, it's whale watching season, and people, as well as the whales, are out in droves here on the peninsula. This past weekend, whale watchers reported seeing a record numbers of California gray whales. And of course, the favorite spot to check out these amazing mammals is the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. So grab your binoculars, get out there early, and remember, we'll be celebrating Whale of a Day at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center on Saturday, March 2nd. Always a fun event. And we'll be there, and we look forward to seeing you there as well. And that will do it for us. From everyone here at RPV TV, make it a great day.